Good evening and thanks for joining. I'm Bill Van Orsdell. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for WaveCloud. And this is the WaveCloud Wednesday webinar on what to know before paying for ebook conversion. I've started up the session tonight with the webcam live. Uh, just to let you know, there's a real person sitting back here. Um, if you'd like to ask questions, there's a facility inside the GoToMeeting um, toolbar on the upper right-hand part of your screen where you can punch a question in. Uh, I'd like to make this as interactive as possible, so feel free to type in any question you'd like, and I'll try to fit it into the presentation. Um, you can also you know, tell me to speed up, go slower, uh, whatever you'd like. Um, but again, thanks for joining. Uh, I know that the web webcam takes up bandwidth not only on my end, but possibly on yours, so I'm going to kill it now. I'll start it again, uh, perhaps at the end of the session. So uh, this is our Wednesday night webinar on what to know before paying for ebook conversion. Um, we'll try to get this done in about uh, 50 minutes, leaving plenty of time for questions either at the end or in the middle. Again, thanks for joining. Um, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, here's my email address. If you'd like copies of the slides, I'm more than happy to send them to you. Um, and I also want to just sort of check in with some assumptions. I'm assuming that you're, you've come to the webinar tonight because you're in charge of doing ebook conversions. So you might be the author, uh, you might be the publisher, you might be an agent, um, any of those uh, whose task it is to make sure that you do the right conversion for the right distribution channels and, and get it done effectively and efficiently. Um, and that this is more than a hobby. This is a business. Um, publishing a book is a business. Publishing books is a business. And the most successful self-published authors treat it like a business. And they usually have a plan, or at least they're building a plan. Um, they're figuring out the production schedule. They're figuring out the marketing plan, the marketing schedule, the marketing budget. And that part of that plan is to actually make money. And in fact, to make more money than you spend on the effort to bring your book to market and to market it. Um, I talk to lots of authors. And uh, one of the things that I always ask them is, what's their goal when they're publishing their book? And invariably, I ask them to add one more goal to that set, whatever that set is, whether the set is I want to change the world, I want to help people, I want to get my story out there, I want other people to uh, not make the same mistakes I did, I just want to entertain folks with my great storytelling. I always ask them to add one more goal, and that is the goal to do what we call earn out. Earn out against the money that you invest in producing and marketing your book. It's a little bit different than the traditional meaning in the traditional publishing world of earn out against your advance, but it essentially looks like this. Tally up all the money that you've spent converting your book, doing your book cover, doing your marketing, launching your book, uh, add all that together and compare it against all of the money that you earn selling your book. And we'd like you to make it a goal to earn more than you spent. Because once you do that, every book sale afterwards is pure gravy. And um, of course, the easiest way to do that is to spend nothing. Um, that can work. It's hard to make that work. You've got to invest in your business. Um, but we want you to invest as little as possible. So the idea here tonight is to give you as much knowledge as possible about the various topics around self-publishing. Tonight we're going to be talking about conversion and formats and so forth. So that when you go out there and either do this yourself or hire someone to do it for you, um, that you'll get it done effectively and for a good price. Uh, that's not too expensive, and you'll get what you need, and nothing more, nothing less. This is not a sales pitch tonight. I'm the marketing guy at WaveCloud. Um, I've got some folks that would love to talk to you if you're interested, if you need help, um, but that's not what we're doing tonight. This is really about um, just educating authors about what's going on out there. And we are an author services platform and an ebook store. We've got a lot of ebooks in our store. We've got all the best sellers, I think, from all the publishers except uh, perhaps Simon & Schuster. But we really want to focus on promoting self-published authors and indie authors. Um, we also have a full spectrum of services that we offer to um, self-published authors. Um, we, you know, whether you use us or someone else or you do it yourself, we want authors to be successful. We are readers. We like to read stories. We like to read stories from new authors. And um, that's our goal. That's how we want authors to be successful. Tonight, I'm asking for interaction. Um, raise your hand if you don't understand or put a question in the question box 
and I'll stop and I'll answer it. I'm happy to do so. I'm also going to launch a couple of surveys tonight as we go through here just to take the pulse of the audience to see um, uh, not only for my information but also for your information to see what everyone else is out there, uh, at what stage they're in in their, their publishing journey. So just to get us used to the interface, I'm going to go ahead and launch the first survey tonight, um, which is where are you? What time zone are you sitting in? So I just fired up the um, time zone poll. You can take a moment and just click on one of those answers and let me know what time zone you're sitting in. It also gets us uh, familiar with the way this interface works. So I'll keep that survey over for open for another few minutes. I'm sorry, not another few seconds. I'll just start a little countdown for us. So five, four, three, two, one. All right. So I've got one person in central time zone. I'll, I'll share the results. I've got one person in this, in the, uh, I got 50% of us, or 100% of us, sorry, in this central time zone. That's great. Um, one of the reasons I ask this question is because I want to know when we should schedule these, when it's most convenient uh, for authors to attend. So in case you can't stay, you know, the common wisdom is that when you're giving a presentation, uh, your, the, your most effective time is the first seven minutes. That's when you actually have their attention. Then typically they drift off, and then at, back at the end of the presentation, they'll sort of come back and pay attention as you're wrapping up. So in case you have to leave, or at the very least so that you get the key message tonight, I'm going to start with our conclusion. And our conclusion, our best recommendation for um, self-publishing authors, is to distribute your book in seven places. Of course, Amazon, everybody thinks about Amazon as the place to distribute their book, but we also think that Barnes & Noble, Apple, and Kobo for the ebook format of your book are very important. Uh, Apple reaches a very closed audience of iPad users. Barnes & Noble has uh, plenty of diehard users who just won't go to Amazon. And Kobo does great things internationally, especially in English-speaking international markets. So these are four very effective platforms for you to have your ebook in for sale. Second, we think that you should also use your Anchor website for all of your formats, to sell all of your formats. So if you've got a, you know, www.billvanorsdale.com or you've got um, www.thelightningtrilogies.com or you've got a blog spot or a, uh, some other blog on a third-party blog site that you're using as your Anchor site. Maybe you're using Facebook as your Anchor site. You should be selling your book there. And I don't just mean marketing it, but I also mean with a link to sell your book directly or, and or more importantly, links back to Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and Kobo, and, and it's not possible for Apple, but you should be selling directly off of your side as well. And of course, the last two spaces are where we recommend that you put your print on demand books. We'll talk about what that means a little bit later, but we think everyone should put their print on demand book up in CreateSpace and in Ingram Spark. We'll talk about why we recommend both of those and, and what you do when you get it up there. Now, the second key thing to learn tonight is the five key formats for self-publishing authors. So here, here's what you've got to know. Um, you want to, when you go to get your book converted, you want to, you want, first of all, you want the files back, right? When you do conversion, you should be getting the files back so they're in your control and, and because you're paying for them. So you want the Mobi version, the EPUB version, you want a PDF version, you want a Smashwords friendly version of your document, and I'll tell you what that means in a moment. And of course, you want a print-on-demand format. We'll talk about what print-on-demand is and why it's so much better than short-run printing and uh, how it's a very effective way to bring your book to market. And the third thing I'd like you to take away tonight is, where possible, I'm recommending that you turn off digital rights management on your book. So um, we'll talk about what DRM is if you're not familiar with it and why it's good to have it off instead of on. Um, and then as a bonus tip, I sort of always like to throw in one extra to make sure people are paying attention. Um, you've got to proof your book before and after conversion. And, and you're looking for completely different things, of course. Um, before you send your book to the converter, make sure it is 100% final proofread is done. And that you have all the extra components like the preface or the foreword or the dedication page or the ISBN and the copyright and the legal disclaimer page. So you've got to have your book not only 100% complete, but 100% proofread before you go to conversion. Otherwise, you're going to get it back, and you're going to be reading it, and you're going to find a couple of typos, and you'll think, wow, 
that is not going to do good things for my reviews on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. Uh, I better fix those and have it reconverted, and you'll just pay twice for the same service. And it's uh, it's it's not the most effective use of uh, your limited budget as a self-publishing author. And of course, after conversion, you know, before you actually hit the publish button, but after you've uploaded it, you want to you want to take that book and you want to um, literally flip through every single page and make sure that there aren't any widows and orphans and make sure that it's laid out uh, exactly the way you want it to be when you uploaded it to the site or before you uploaded it to the site. Okay, so why does this, why does ebook file format and ebook conversion and, and why does it matter? Why do we care? We care for a very simple reason. Conversion choices drive distribution options. So depending on where you want to put your book, and we've given you the this, this seven recommendations where we think you should put it, um, you need to have it available in the format that that retailer wants to sell it in. You know, the goal here is your book getting into the hands of as many readers as possible. And so whether you sell it, whether you give it away, whether you give out advanced reader copies or review copies, whether you sell it through these online bookstores, sell it through your own website, or you're selling it indirectly through uh, retailers, either other online bookstores or um, you're selling it in bricks and mortar bookstores, um, you want to get your book into the hands of, many as of as many readers as possible. Wider distribution gives you more chances for exposure and to sell your book. It gives you more chances. Um, uh, when you have more chances to sell, you get more book sales. It's just it's a it's a pure numbers game. And with more book sales, you start this cycle of readers and referrals. You know, after um, you know, when you, when we ask readers, when when readers are surveyed and they and you ask them, uh, how do you find your next book that you want to read? Well, the number one way that they find the next book they want to read is from an author that they already like. They go see if that author, if one of their favorite authors, has a new book out. The second most important, and it's a very close second, is word of mouth. So, you know, I hear heard about this book online. I read about this book in an article. I um, I heard about it from a friend or from a family member, and that got me interested in reading this book. So the more books you have out there, the better your chances of developing that word of mouth. Now, I just want to take a quick poll real quick, and let's see um, what the status is of your book in the audience. So if you would, give me a sense of... Um, have you started it? Are you writing it? Is it done? Is the editing done? Um, or maybe it's already in the market. If you would, just take a moment and vote there and uh, tell me what's the status of your book. All right, I'm going to leave this poll open for about five more seconds uh, to get everybody to vote. That's five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'll close it. Now let's share the results. So um, it looks like everybody's got their book in the market, which is fantastic. Um, uh, and maybe you've got another book coming to market or you want to put it in more places, which is why you're, you're listening tonight, which is fantastic. Um, and we're happy to help with any of that and all of that. All right, I'm going to close that poll out and let's move on to the next step, which is um, where do you plan to sell? So uh, just about every author we talk to knows about Amazon.com. Right? They know about going to kdp.amazon.com and uploading their ebook and getting into the market now. Amazon has the overwhelming majority of the market share. I think they're north of 60%, depending on the genre and depending on whether you're talking about um, uh, ebooks or print books. But they do a fantastic job of selling books. It's what Amazon started doing. Um, so, of course, we think you should sell there. It's a critical place to do very, very well. Not the only place we think you ought to put your book, but it's very important to sell there. We also think that selling on your anchor site is absolutely critical. Um, that site could be your Tumblr blog. It could be your Blogspot blog. It could be your Facebook page. It could be your uh, um, your your my my special domain dot com page, where you focus uh, where you focus on selling your books and telling your story. Um, we think that's a pretty important place to go because ultimately, if you can drive traffic and drive readers to your own personal site, you've got a better chance of developing some permission-based marketing rights with them. And so having an anchor site where you sell and promote your books is very important. Now, we also think that those, and I mentioned these before, the three other major bookstores um, in the United States, barnesandnoble.com, which is where people who have a nook go to buy their books, uh, Apple, of course, 
and Kobo.com. Now, you may not have heard of Kobo. They've got a great, um, they're making some great inroads internationally. They're a Canadian company. And they've actually uh, started to outpace Amazon in some places. Additionally, there may be other online bookstores uh, that are specific for your genre. So, for example, there's uh, uh, allromance.com, and uh, there are some other genre-specific sites. Uh, there's also an aggregator, a distribution aggregator known as Smashwords, and if you haven't heard of Smashwords, they're worth taking a look at. They're, they're a competitor of ours, but I have a lot of respect for their CEO, and they've got some great people that work there, and they do a great job of getting your book up on some sites that you may not have heard of, like Flipkart, or maybe into library systems, or maybe into the Oyster system. So Smashwords is worth looking at as well, and you'll see that's why we recommend getting a Smashwords-friendly format. I'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Now, of course, every, every writer uh, is keen to see their book in a bookstore. Um, Bricks-and-mortar bookstores are an important source of distribution. They're very difficult for self-published authors to get into directly, but you can get in indirectly. You can, once you set up your book at Ingram Spark or at Lightning Source, your, it's highly likely that your local bookstores will be carrying a, a record of your book in their system. So that if someone goes into the store and says, hey, I'd like to buy this book by Bill Van Orsdell, uh, and here's the title, the clerk will look it up in the system and say, well, we don't have that in stock, but we can order it. It'll be here in a, in a few days. Could I take your number? So if you follow the advice we've got in here, you can essentially sell through bookstores as well. And of course, if you uh, have a good relationship with the uh, buying manager at a local store, you may be able to get them to stock your book as well. I talk to a lot of authors who are doing specialty, specialty channels, so they'll be selling uh, batches of books to schools or to government entities or to business entities or to convention bureaus or to gift stores, or they'll sell them to doctor's offices or veterinary offices uh, to, for giveaways as freemiums. And uh, that's an important uh, channel that you shouldn't overlook, uh, depending on what kind of book you've got. And you may be one of the nonfiction authors out there who's selling their book at the back of the room at a speaking engagement, at a speaking venue. And so um, knowing that you're trying to do that is also important when you are looking at um, distribution options. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pop up another survey real quick, which is, um, I'm just curious because we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, uh, how many folks out there have an author anchor site already? Um, or maybe you're building one. So just give me a, a quick sense, if you would. Click on the button there that represents the, the best um, approximation of where you are with your author anchor site, uh, because I've got some ideas later, and we'll spend a little more or a little less time on them um, if, we, uh, if we get a good response. So I'll close this poll out in about five more seconds. So five, four, three, two. It looks like everyone's voted. Fantastic. So I will close the poll. And I'll share the results. So it looks like everybody online tonight has uh, their own website, which is fantastic. Um, I hope you're already selling. If you're not, I've got a great solution for you to look at. Uh, it's not a company that we're associated with, but I think they've got the best solution out there. Um, and it's called Gumroad. And I'll show you what that looks like. So you don't have to set up your own card or you don't have to uh, know any code or anything. You just put the stuff right up on your site. All right, so I'm going to hide that poll. Let's move on to the next page. So. What are we talking about here? What, when, we, when we're doing conversion, what we're really talking about is creating a packaged product out of your book. Your book really is, your, your content of your book really is the product, but we need to create a packaged version of, of that that's consumable by your reader and sellable by a store. And there are really two main elements to that. Number one, you need to have a book cover. And um, we're going to have another webinar later about what makes a great book cover for fiction or nonfiction and, you know, some things to look out for when you're essentially art directing the creation of your own book covers. Um, but, you know, book covers in the ebook world have a front, but in the print world, they have a back and a spine, and sometimes they have flaps. Uh, and I'll, take a, I'll show you a diagram what that looks like as well. Um, so in addition to your book cover, we also have the interior layout of your book. And the interior layout of your ebook is different from the interior layout of your print book. Uh, I talk to a lot of authors who, um, especially debut authors, who want to produce an ebook, and yet they don't read ebooks. And so they're not familiar with the conventions in ebooks, such as uh, page one is your cover, and uh, text is reflowable, and you can't wrap text around pictures and, and things like that. Um, so with those two elements, you should know that there are at least four, and we haven't even talked about an audiobook, but there are at least 
four versions, uh, traditional versions, of uh, formats for books. Uh, and of course, we're, you know, we're all familiar with how publishers used to window their product introductions. So they would um, drop a hardcover in the market, they would let that run for a couple of months, they'd drop a trade paperback, which is roughly the same size as a hardcover, but with a, a paperback binding instead of a hardcover. And then they would make a smaller trim size and create the mass market paperback. And now, of course, uh, then what they would do is they would introduce an ebook. It's not very common now uh, for traditional publishers to do that windowing strategy anymore. Uh, most of them are dropping a, a trade paperback or a mass market paperback right in the market at the same time they drop their ebook. I've seen a few cases um, with some unique circumstances where they'll drop a hardcover for a while and then come up with the ebook and the mass market paperback or the trade paperback. But the key is that. Um, uh, as a self-published author, you're going to hit the market usually first with an ebook. Um, we think it's also important to have a print book out there as well. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, within the ebook world, there are several subformats. Plus, there's this concept of digital rights management, which is really a wrapper uh, or a subvariant of a, of a digital format. So let's talk. I've mentioned print on demand a couple of times. Let's talk about it for a moment. It's really nothing more than short-run printing. It's essentially a print run of one, although there's a little secret about that. I'll tell you, it's usually almost never just one. Um, but essentially, it works like this. You set up the, the cover file, you set up the interior layout file of your print book, and you load it onto a server, or your bookstore does. And then when someone comes onto their website to buy the book, those two files get sent down to a printing press. And they're a special version of your files. They're sent to a printing press, and the book is immediately printed, and then the pages are cut, and it's uh, the then the cover is bound up around the book. And they ship it, usually within a day. And so unlike the old world where you had to do short print runs of maybe 100 or 1,000 or 2,000 or 3,000 books, which if a book, if you can get it for a buck or two bucks or three bucks, or maybe it's a hardcover so you're getting it for five or seven or 10 or 12 bucks, you know, a run of a thousand is a significant investment, and there are probably more than a few garages and basements and spare bedrooms filled with books. Uh, when an author um, thought that they had a big sale or 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 uh, uh, didn't understand print on demand and decided to go do a short print run, they got a lot of books that they're trying to move. So the benefit of print on demand is all of that inventory risk disappears. So you, as an author, don't have to shell out a bunch of money. Um, we recommend to all of our authors that they do print on demand. And the reason we do is because it's free. Setting up print on demand as a format availability for your book is free on CreateSpace. Um, you have to have the files, um, but those aren't incrementally. They only cost a little bit more. Um, but so they're very easy to do. And they're a great way to meet the demand of the rest of your market. What do I mean by that? Well, in the um, in the, in some genres, ebook adoption rates are huge. They they can be as much as fifty to eighty percent. So in some romance titles, uh, romance genres, uh, science fiction, fantasy, thriller genres, the uptake on a given book could be fifty percent, eighty percent of all unit sales are ebooks. That still leaves fifty to twenty percent of that market in the fiction world uh, of people who would prefer to buy your book as a print book for whatever reason. They don't own a reader. They don't like them. They they like to be old fashioned with with books. Um, whatever their reason is, it's all perfectly valid. They're a reader, they're a potential customer of yours, and you need to have a print version available for them to order online of your book. In the nonfiction world, this is even more important. The nonfiction world hasn't had nearly the same uptake um, uh, with the ebook format as the fiction world has. So, uh, pr probably two thirds of almost any uh, nonfiction title is going to be um, sold in. Uh, the print version, you know, assuming a print version is available. People just like to have a print version that they can underline or write on uh, or pass along and share. So we recommend that, that everyone do print on demand, uh, mainly because it's so cheap to do it and it can be very effective. I'm going to throw up another survey real quick. Just to, just want to take the pulse about print on demand uh, to see if you've already done it, if you're thinking about doing it. Just take a minute, if you would, and uh, pick the response there that makes the most sense for you. All right, I'm going to 
uh, leave this poll open for five more seconds, give everyone a chance to vote. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'll close it out. We'll share it. So we've already got print on demand. So I'm preaching to the choir. Um, I hope that you did. Uh, I hope you did an effective one that wasn't too expensive, and you've got it in the right places. Or um, I'm happy to take any questions about that if you'd like. If you want to post them in the question box inside there, uh, I'm happy to talk about it. But it uh, looks like we've already got folks that are happy with print on demand. So that's good. All right, so if you've done print on demand, you're probably already pretty familiar with trim size, so I can move through this pretty quickly. You know, there are industry standard trim sizes, and the reason we recommend to all of our authors that they pick a standard trim size is because you can use one set of files. So you can use one ebook cover and one interior layout file at both CreateSpace and in the Ingram system. And we'll talk about why we think you should be in both CreateSpace and Ingram, but the key is if you take a look at these standard trim sizes, you know, there's probably one to fit just about every kind of book out there. And, and when authors say to me, well, Bill, which, which one of these do I want? What I say is, well, when you did your research into your genre, uh, into the, the com books that were competitive in your genre, you went into the bookstore with a ruler and you measured the, the trim size, which is merely the, you know, the, the width and the height of the front page of their book, you know, what was the dominant trim size amongst your, your genre or your subject area in the bookstore? because that's the same trim size that you want. If someone collects books in your genre, like they collect science fiction books or diet books or books on how to be a better business speaker, um, they have this expectation that the books generally sort of fit inside of a standard trim size. And you know, you'd be surprised how many people's bookshelves are set to a certain height. So um, trim size is important and it's easy to figure out. You just go and uh, see what your competitors are doing. I talked earlier about the cover plan, of course, uh, the spine, the front cover, the back cover, and front flaps. It's hard in the self-published world to get flaps either, well, number one, because it's hard to get a book uh, hardcover done. Um, but there are also some trade paperback printers who will print fold-in flaps. It's actually pretty neat, and it's a great way to uh, add to the value of your book uh, with a flap. Uh, but I just want to show this quick diagram uh, for those who might not be familiar with it. Uh, familiar with the uh, the layout of the way a, a book gets a uh, book cover gets done, and we'll talk about spine in a minute. Spine is the variable part of your book cover. It depends on the thickness of your book, which of course depends on how many pages it is. All right, so let's get into the meat of it: the, the relevant file formats for a self-publishing author. When you're thinking about, you know, what what should I ask for when I go get my conversion done? Um, we think that there are four formats that really matter. There's uh, most obviously the EPUB and the Mobi, Mobi formats, and, and we'll match those up to channels in a moment. But the EPUB format is uh, supposed to be the industry standard, except the largest industry player, Amazon, doesn't use it. They adopted the Mobi format instead. Um, we also think that all authors should do a Smashword-friendly version. So when we do conversions for authors, um, we give them back a Word document that is, um, usually we get a Word document from authors, and we give them back a Word document that will flow through the Smashwords meat grinder engine um, without complaint. And so why is that important? Uh, uh, Smashwords is a great company, and they've automated this conversion process. Uh, the problem is you, you can't really use their files anywhere else, and, and uh, they take a cut of all of your revenue as it comes through. Now, this works for some, some authors. It, 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 we do this for some authors as well. We've got a distribution service. Um, and some authors absolutely say, look, I, I want to write. I want to be a writer. I don't want to be a computer uploader. And so you handle it all for me. I don't care if you take 10 or 15% of all of the inbound revenue. And, and Smashwords, if you're not familiar with it, they can get you in some places, uh, some very interesting places like Flipkart uh, in India. Um, they can get you into... Uh, they have the potential to get you into the into some library systems and into the Oyster system. So there is a fair uh, there's a fair utility to be had with Smashwords. If you don't have a Mac or have access to a Mac, Smashwords is also available to get your book up into the Apple iBook Store. So it looks like I've got a question, uh, perhaps from Eugene. Eugene, if you've got a question, do me a favor and uh, punch it into the um, questions box. It should be there on the control set to the top right of your screen. 
there's a there should be a question section that you can expand and then load one in there and I'll I'll get to it as soon as you're able to put it in there. Um, so ebook file ebook uh, reader ready file file format. So what do we mean what do you mean by reader ready? Well, um, you know there are devices. So there's uh, Apple devices, whether it's a phone or an iTouch or an iPad or an iPad Mini. There are Android Android devices, and there's plenty of generic Android devices from companies like Motorola and Samsung and Asus. Um, there is also a closed uh, Android device. It's the whole Fire system from um, from Amazon, and essentially. Whether the whether you've got a standalone reader or whether you've got software specific software that runs on that reader, we're talking about the file formats that that device needs to properly show your book. So the fourth format that we think everyone should create their book in is the PDF format. There's a there's a, su a surprisingly, maybe even shockingly high percentage of people that read ebooks. They want to read the ebook on their PC or their laptop. And so one way that you can deliver it to them is, of course, in the PDF format. There are a couple of other formats that are worth talking about. There's HTML, there's EPUB 3.0, and there's iAuthor. Um, they have too many limitations uh, to be useful for a widespread distribution, but um, you should know about them as options. One of the reasons I like HTML as an option for uh, formatting your book is because it, in theory, is the future-proof option. So whether EPUB goes to the 4.0 standard or the 5.0 standard, and whether Moby changes to KF8 or something else, or Smashwords advances to some other state of the art, in theory, having it in HTML uh, sort of future proofs it. Um, it makes it so that five years or 10 years from now, when you're trying to upload it to the whatever the dominant bookstore is at that time, uh, you'll still have it in a version that, that can be consumed properly by the, the, the file formats of the day. EPUB the EPUB 3.0 format, format is the format, the currently ratified format of EPUB. Although, because no one in the industry, in the reader industry, has adopted it yet, so in other words, there's no reader software and no reader hardware that will read the EPUB 3.0 format, um, oversimplifying a little bit, everyone is still using the EPUB 2.0 format. So when you see everywhere in this presentation, when you see just EPUB all by itself, it really means the EPUB 2.0 format. And of course, iAuthor is a very specific tool um, that's provided for free by Apple uh, to create books that can only be used in the Apple Bookstore. Of course, you can submit an EPUB to the Apple Bookstore and get your book in there, but iAuthor allows you to do some very unique and interactive things. It's actually kind of a precursor to EPUB 3.0. Um, we don't have many authors that build iAuthor books, and that's mainly because uh, Apple's share of the of the ebook market is uh, probably less than 15%, and that would mean they have to actually lay out their book twice, once in iAuthor and, and once in EPUB, and probably also in Mobi while you're at it. So um, when we talk about a print book or doing print-on-demand, we talk about a press-ready file format. Now, it's actually a version of PDF, but it's the X2 or X3 or X1 version of PDF. It's... Um, it's it's you know PDF was originally designed as a, a format for printers to use to send files to printing presses. So when you're doing print on demand, you're actually going to create or receive from your conversion people a special version of the PDF format. Um, the great news is that you can use that that file in CreateSpace. CreateSpace, of course, is a subsidiary of Amazon. It's where you upload your on demand files, your your print on demand files, so that they can be shown in the Kindle bookstore, in the Amazon bookstore, as a uh, uh, as a, a print book ready to ship. Uh, and that same set of files can be used at Lightning Source or Ingram Spark. Now, Lightning Source and Ingram Spark are two different faces of the same company, um, Ingram, Ingram Content Distribution. And Lightning Source is if you're a small press or if you have lots of books that you want to run through and you you really know what you're doing you go through lightning source but if you're a self-published author or this or your debut author or this is your first book or you have just a few and you're not going to be publishing a bunch of books then Ingram spark is probably a cheaper and slightly better easier to use uh, version of the same service <clears throat> we recommend to all of our authors that they pick create space because that's the only way to guarantee that your print-on-demand book, the print version of your book, shows up in the Amazon store 
as in stock. And that's what you want. When someone is considering purchasing your book, you don't want it to say ships in two or three weeks. You want it to say ships now, available for prime shipping. Um, similarly, when you pick Ingram, one of the two Ingram solutions, either Lightning Source or Ingram Spark, that makes your book show up in the ordering systems and the inventory management systems of most bookstores in the United States. So again, someone could walk into a bookstore and say, hey, I really want that new Alien First Contact Science Fiction book by Bill Van Orsdell. Do you have it in stock? I didn't see it on the shelf. And the clerk will look up Bill Van Orsdell in the system and they'll say, wow, you know, we don't have that in stock right now, but I can order it for you. It'll be here in a few days. Can I take your name? The only way to make sure that the, that, that shows up in the library system and that the library system will order it is to do it through Ingram. If you do it through CreateSpace and pick their expanded distribution, uh, the problem is that uh, the bookstore may, may look at that and see that it comes from Amazon and say, no, I'm not going to sell you that book. Uh, similarly, if you put your book in Ingram, in the Ingram system, either Lightning Source or Ingram Spark, and you click their expanded distribution, in theory to put it in the Amazon bookstore, you're likely to have a book that shows up as ships in two or three weeks. Um, we've already talked a little bit about print runs, short runs, long runs, and digital versus offset. The only thing I'd really say here is if, you, if you've pre-sold some books, so you already know that uh, you know, all of the unemployment offices in the state of South Carolina uh, are going to give a free copy of your uh, How to Build My Resume book to the next 20,000 people that walk through the door next month, then you should go do a short print run of 20,000 books once you have that order in hand. Um, all of your print-on-demand uh, facilities are going to be a, are going to be a digital press. They won't be offset. Offset looks better than digital. Offset can be better for uh, books with a lot of color in them. Um, but when you do print-on-demand, you're doing digital. Okay, so I talked before about how um, your choice of conversion formats um, limits or enables your choices of distribution channels. So let's map our choices for um, formats to the stores and what the stores want. So Amazon.com, which of course is where people who own a Kindle go and buy all their books, they want a Mobi version. Uh, and, and through CreateSpace, they'll take a print-on-demand version. Um, your anchor site, I think you should be selling all of your ebook formats on your anchor site. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes when we get to Gumroad. But the point is that um, when people are coming to your anchor site, not only is it the best practice to offer them a link to go buy your book on Amazon, to buy it on Barnes & Noble, to buy it on Kobo, uh, how to find it in the, in the uh, Apple bookstore, but also you want to give them a link to buy the book right there from you. Because when they do that, uh, you can capture, hopefully, their uh, email address, you can capture their information so that you can uh, message back to them and let them know when your next book is going to be out and ask them, for example, when your next book comes out, hey, would you help me vote on a cover? Would you, help, would you vote on one of my covers? I've got six to choose from. I'd like to know what my fans think of, the, of my cover choices. Um, uh, number three on this list is Barnes & Noble, Nook, Apple, and Kobo. Right? So the Barnes & Noble is where the people that own a Nook go and get their books. Uh, Apple and Kobo as well. All three of them accept the EPUB format. Now, of course, on many of these sites, you could just upload a Word document and let the site do the translation for you into their own format. The reason I suggest authors don't do that is because um, you don't have great control over the way your um, your book looks after that conversion. Um, I would highly recommend um, having it done professionally and by hand, not automated on an automated basis. We talked a little bit about Smashwords and how a Smashwords Word Smashwords friendly Word doc is in a, is a good format to have. Uh, about how if you're going to do uh, the bricks and mortar stores, um, print on demand is the format you want. Similarly for specialty channels or short print, uh, if especially for specialty, uh, similarly for specialty channels, uh, we recommend print on demand. You know, if you are a, a speaker and you're doing a lot of sales in the back of the room, uh, I recommend a print on demand service. Once you're set up in um, Ingram Spark or you're set up in CreateSpace, you can order from them uh, books in lots of 10 or 100 or 12 or 72 or whatever number, magic number works, and have them shipped directly to the venue where you're going to be speaking. Uh, and it's very affordable to have them do that. Um, I also recommend ebook cards because you'll be speaking 
and your audience will want to buy your book. And some of them are um, some of them are already locked into the Kindle world or into the Apple world, and they want to buy your book on one of those at one of those places, or they just want to buy the regular non-DRM version of your book. And if you've got some ebook cards in the back of the room, uh, those are easy to uh, to sell as well. I'm going to pop open uh, number six just to get a sense of where people are selling or where they're planning to sell their books. This one's a little different. This uh, uh, this survey is a little different than the prior one. You can choose more than one. I think so, yes. You can select all that apply. So I'll give you a few minutes to vote and, and let me know if you would on uh, about your plans about where you plan to distribute. It'll be interesting to see where everyone is doing it. All right, we are, I'll keep this open for about uh, five more seconds. So five, four, three, two, one. All right, I'll close the poll and I'll share the results. So clearly everybody is already selling or planning to sell on Amazon or their anchor site or Barnes & Noble. Only some though in the Apple iBook store or in Kobo. So that's very interesting. Um, all right, I'll hide those results. Now we'll go down to the next Go on our next slide. We're starting to run low on time, and I'm talking a little too long this evening. So let's talk about interior layout and readability. Um, when you're, if you decide to do this yourself, which is you know perfectly fine, you know you've got to understand how reflowable text uh, affects your choices about what you're doing inside your book. Um, it's very common in an ebook interior layout to have an active table of contents where if you click on a chapter heading, it takes you right to the chapter. If you click on that chapter heading, it brings you right back to the table of contents. Um, similarly, if you're uh, writing a nonfiction book and you've got uh, footnotes or endnotes, we recommend that you move those to um, uh, to chapter endnotes. Uh, if you happen to be a fan of Malcolm Gladwell, and you can see this done very effectively in his most recent book called uh, David and Goliath. At the end of each of his chapter, he's got end of chapter notes that correspond to some of the superscripts inside each chapter. And really, you can, uh, because the chapter was so close, you just finished reading it, you can read through the endnotes, and it, it's a pretty effective way to, without breaking your flow of reading in an ebook, it's a pretty effective way to present the endnotes. Also, and we'll talk about this a little, in a little more detail on the next slide, or the slide after that, HTML links. We highly recommend uh, when you're doing an ebook that at the end of the ebook, you put HTML links either for reviews or for your next book, your next book in a series, your other books. Uh, or, um, uh, uh, and we'll talk about that in a, in a little more in a few minutes. Um, and of course, you know, you need to know that when you're doing your ebook interior layout, that fonts, you know, you may have picked a font that you really, really like, but most readers uh, enforce a limited set of fonts. And no matter what you chose, they'll change your font into that font. Uh, and images, you can't quite do as many fancy, snazzy layout things with images inside a reflowable text ebook as you can inside a, a, a print book or even a fixed page layout book. When it comes to print interior concepts, print interior layout concepts, um, you know, there's a reason why, you know, this, you keep seeing the same six typefaces show up in just about every printed book, and that's for readability. That's for ease of readability. It, you know, they've been using these typefaces for hundreds of years, and, and there's almost an expectation amongst readers that they're seeing a familiar typeface when they go to a book. Line length is important. You know, when you're designing the interior layout of your book or you're having someone do it for you, you know, make sure, I, I know it says 10 to 15 words per page. That should be 10 to 15 words per line because you don't want to have funny line breaks in your, um, in your books, in your lines. Uh, and leading, which is really line spacing. And, and there's like a half dozen more. So, you know, if you're not a professional interior designer, it's probably a good idea to either study up on it or, um, I get a professional to do it for you. It's not terribly expensive. The one thing I will say about print interior is that generally you have to have the interior layout for your print book complete before you're able to complete the, uh, the, the print book cover design. And the reason is simple. The interior layout um, dictates how thick your spine is, um, which gives your designer, lets your designer know how much room to put how much room they have to put stuff on your spine and how wide it needs to be in the design. So you have to complete that interior layout before you get there. Oops. Um, okay, and then one of the problems uh, that a lot of our authors have 
uh, and I like to highlight it here is, you know, is the interior content complete? And, you know, a lot of authors say, well, I've written the book, it's fully edited, it's ready to go. And then I ask them, well, did you have a dedication page? Did you create a verso page? Um, is there a bibliography or index or any notes or an about the author or from the author? Or, and there's a whole set of print interior stuff, some of which translates over to the ebook interior, not all of which, though. Um, and, and they say, oh, wow, I forgot about all of that stuff, or I've got some of them and I don't have all of them. Um, also, we talked a little bit before about um, special, the special interior, ebook interior stuff. Um, your book cover image is usually page one. That's sort of a standard, and that's so that when your book displays, uh, it will display properly um, on page one, showing your book cover in a, in a car reader carousel, some software. Uh, also, we recommend HTML links at the back of your, at the end of your story or after your last chapter with links to your anchor site, links to, to how to leave a book review. You know, you might have, it might say, hey, I hope you really, I hope you enjoyed reading this book. If you did, I'd, I'd be humbled, I'd be humbly appreciative of, of a review. It helps other readers uh, find my book, and here's a link to get that done. And if you've got a series, here's the next book in my series, or here are others, here's a link to other books I've written. Note that when you do that, you need to customize those links for each retail store. So you can't put the Barnes & Noble links in the Mobi file, and you can't put the Amazon links in the EPUB file. And in the EPUB file, you want to have one that's good for Apple and one that's good for Barnes & Noble and one that's good for Kobo. So you kind of have to, if you're going to go this route, and I highly recommend that all of our authors do, um, because it's a great way during your launch strategy to help build your uh, reviews, um, you got to make sure you customize them for each version. Okay, I think I just went through all those post-text extras, so links to my next book, my other books, my anchor site, please review this book. I talked about the table of contents and the chapter one. Good. Okay, let's talk about digital rights management for just a moment. Did I skip a, I think I skipped a survey here. Let's just take a look at survey seven real quick. Uh, let's see, I want to know who's doing end of link books already. So let's take a look at that. If you would, just take a look at this poll and let me know, are you already doing end of, uh, end of book HTML links in your eBooks? And this is so the people that are reading your eBooks on a device that already has a browser, that they're already doing this and they've already got it. All right, looks like everybody's voted. I'm gonna go ahead and close this out and I'll share the results back. So let's see, so we've got uh, a third of our audience is already using more than one link. That's pretty sophisticated. Um, we've got some, some uh, a third of our audience who says, hey, I'm going to start using them now. And um, so I haven't been clear enough on what I mean by a link at the end of the book. So I'll, I'll try to explain it one more time just real quickly. If I get to the end of my ebook, and it sort of says, you know, and they have lived happily ever after the end, and I use my finger and I flip the page. Everybody usually flips the page to see what comes next. Um, we advise our authors, put a little piece of text in there that says, hey, thank you very much for reading this book. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you want to see what happens next to the happy couple, or if you want to see if, if they save the day or, or, or Emperor Zorg wins, here's a link to my next book. And it's literally a URL link. It's a hot link that will go directly to Amazon to your book sales page for your next book. Or, if selling your next book in the series is not your prime directive, instead getting a review for this book is, then you post a link right back to this book. Or you post a link back to your anchor site, or you post one to all three. So the idea here is that while your reader is euphoric about your book, they're excited, they're happy, they've had a great time reading it, they're, they're ready to go purchase the next one because they're, so, they're, they're having so much fun with your story or your advice, they want to read more from you, you capture their attention and, their, and you offer them some action right at the end of the book. Okay, um, and I'm happy to, if you want to email me, I'm happy to, to go in more detail or talk about that. So let's talk about digital rights management. Let's see how I'm doing on time. Okay, 10 minutes. We've got to move it. So digital rights management. So what is it? Digital rights management is really nothing more than an electronic wrapper that an ebook retailer like Amazon or Barnes & Noble or Apple or Kobo will wrap around your book. So every time somebody buys your book, they put this thing on your book that, in theory, makes it so that when, when I buy your book from the store, I can't copy the file into an email and send it to my sister, and I can't give it to my mom, and I can't post it on a pirate site. Uh, and that's the promise of DRM. The problem is the promise uh, actually doesn't deliver. It's not a Doberman Pinscher worth of security. It's more like a fig leaf. 
Uh, I think any competent uh, 11-year-old, if you if you gave him till noon, um, uh, he could probably strip um, the DRM off of just about any ebook that's out there. Um, and there are a lot of technical reasons why that's possible. The, the fundamental reason is that once you have something in a digital form, you cannot secure it unless you require a consistent and persistent link back to a third party authenticating service. So why does your choice matter? Readers hate DRM. They hate this concept that they can't share this book or do things with it the same way they wouldn't. And they don't really want to do things with it. Nobody wants to buy a book and go put it on a pirate site. But they just feel constrained and it makes them less likely to shop for your book, less likely to buy your book. You make this choice when you're uploading your book into the, um, into the various bookstores. So it, usually it's in your hand. About You can decide whether or not you want to do it or not. I've got a little screenshot here on the bottom um, that shows you, for example, where you do it when you're uploading your Amazon book. I'd be curious about our audience's attitude about DRM. I've got a little poll just to see how we all feel about it. Maybe just take a moment and uh, let me know what you think about DRM. I'd appreciate it. All right, it looks like um, everyone has voted. I'll close it out. I'll share back the results. And, and, and pretty much everyone, again, it must be preaching the choir. I don't want DRM in any of my books ever. Okay, fantastic. I'm going to hide that. I think we're getting into the home stretch, which is good. All right, so um, enabling anchor sites. Well, that title is actually not very helpful. It should be enabling sales. Oh, en enabling anchor site sales. Okay, that's actually correct. Um, so if you're not already selling, and you don't have a cart, and you don't want to build one, and you don't want to go get a degree in Java, um, there is a great service out there. And we, and we don't get any kickback from them. They don't even know who we are. It's called Gumroad. And uh, for a relatively low fee, and this way you don't have to go and become PCI compliant or open up a credit card merchant account or anything like that, um, they've got the ability to uh, enable you with nothing more than a link on your site to sell your uh, to sell your books. Um, and they even have the ability to do an overlay on your site. I'll show you what that means in a moment. But they've got social media tie-ins. They, can, can, they allow you to re-message your customers. You can post all of your formats. When you do that, make sure you label each one correctly. What I really, one of the neat things I like about Gumroad is instead of just putting up your book cover image, you, know, you might have gone out and had a book trailer done. And, and we do those at WaveCloud. We, I mean, we got a great $250 service. We've made some great book covers. And now our authors can take those book, sorry, not book covers, book trailers. Our authors can take their book trailers, essentially a one-minute movie about trying to create an impulse buy on my book, and they can use that as their book cover on their Gumroad um, purchase. It's, it's really cool. Um, I've got a link in here for the Gumroad uh, video. You can also look them up on their site. Uh, they're pretty cool. Uh, what they do. Now I talked about an overlay, so let's say what you want is when someone comes to your anchor site that they don't leave your site to purchase the book. And this is the way that works. So um, here's uh, uh, Nathan Barry. He's a computer programmer. He uses Gumroad to sell lots of different books. They're pretty expensive. He's got one he sells for 99 bucks. And so here when I'm on Nathan's site, I click on the I want to buy this book and it pops up this window right on the top of your website. I don't go off to another site, no, nothing like that. And with a few clicks, um, they're purchasing the book. Uh, so um, it's, Gumroad is pretty cool. And if you're not already selling directly from your site, uh, it's worth checking out. OK, so now we're sort of back to where we started. Um, we're at final recommendations. This is the thing I started with in case you couldn't stay with us the, through the whole presentation. Uh, and we'll just go through these recommendations again. Distribu distribute your eBooks in seven places. Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Apple, and Kobo. Do it on your website. Also create print on demand for CreateSpace and Ingram Spark. Um, get your book back in your possession in a Mobi format, EPUB format, PDF format, Smashwords friendly, print on demand, and where possible, turn off DRM. Make sure you proof before and after. Okay, so uh, next Wednesday, if you're interested, I know we're heading into the holiday buying season. I think 18% of all uh, of all uh, households, U.S. households are planning on buying another tablet this season. And of course, what does everyone want to do with uh, the minute they get their tablet? They want to start putting content on it. So this is a great time to make sure that your Amazon.com book page and your author page uh, are doing all the right things to help you sell books and to make your book discoverable 
to those people that are browsing for books. And so next Wednesday, we're going to have an hour-long seminar to talk about all of those key things that you can do. Uh, just as a quick review, I mean, it, I think it'd be great to have your site open and, as we go through it and, and take a look at it. Again, in this particular slide deck, I've got all of the links. Um, you'll receive these links in the follow-up email uh, that you'll probably get from us tomorrow with uh, a link back to the recording in case you want to watch again. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just flash up the very last survey for tonight. And um, this one uh, is pretty important to me because I'm trying to get a sense of what do you want to see next? What's the next um, presentation that you'd like to see? Give me a sense of which of these topics uh, might be the most valuable. Of course, knowing that topic number one is actually going to happen uh, next Wednesday. But we're going to do these every week, and we need to start scheduling them out. We need to start understanding what people would be interested in. All right, so everybody's voted. I'll go ahead and close it, and I'll share the results with everyone. So it looks like uh, next Wednesday's topic is a winner, but also how to, to conduct effective research uh, for good book marketing, which is actually one of my favorite topics. I spend a lot of time talking to authors about, basically asking a lot of questions about their target market, and, and, um, and uh, often their answers come up short. So um, I'll be putting together a seminar on that. We'll probably make that... Uh, I think that's going to end up being maybe the 8th of January. Um, so look for an invitation to that. Thank you very much for your feedback on that. Um, let's see what I've got next. I think, I think that's, yep. Yeah. So if you've got any questions, I am happy to take them in the uh, questions box right now. You're also welcome to email me with more questions or just ask for a copy of the slide deck. I'm more than happy to send it. And I thank you so much for spending uh, so much time with me this this uh, afternoon, this evening, and uh, I wish you a fantastic day and a great holiday. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Have a great evening.